Thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. And I became loud very quickly. Amen. Are you well? Welcome to church. Welcome to everyone online. As Andrew said, Molly sends a love. Um, our place is being renovated, so we're staying in another place, and these people have cats. And my two boys figured out there's cats and how to get out, so now it's... 24 hours war in that house. And I don't like cats. If you have cats, I'm sorry. So I, all I want to do is open the doors. <laughs> Amen. This morning we're going to finish our series um, on the tabernacle and, and on Revealed. And um, if you see the map in front of you, this is what the actual tabernacle looked like the plan of the tabernacle inside. So we've managed to, we, uh, we've looked at the outer court, we've looked at the fence and the gates and the bro bronze altar. And if you look at the outer court, you'll know it speaks about death and about judgment and what God's plan was through Jesus Christ. But when we move into the inner court this morning, you'll see that it speaks about life and about food and about incense. 
And we all love food. Amen? And it's interesting, and we're not going to cover it in this sequence, but it's very interesting that when God spoke to Moses, He said to Moses, this is how you're going to do it. First, you're going to create the ark, because my presence has to be there. Then we're going to do the table of showbread, the menorah, or the lampstand, and then the altar of incense. And we didn't cover a lot of the priests in this, but you'll, but you'll see as we go along, I'll mention one or two things. But even the priest's clothing, everything they wore, everything they did, and, and, and even the, the, the fact that the presence of God was there and then the table of showbread, they needed priests to do the actual incense burning and um, the bread and everything. So, so there was a, a sequence to everything that God did. Amen. God doesn't get surprised by your issues or your challenges or your problems or life. God has a sequence and a plan that He works. And it's our responsibility, seeing that the ark was first, to get into the presence of God and understand that plan. And make sure that we fall in line. We don't bless, ask God to bless our plans. We take on His plan and we know it will be blessed. Amen. I'm not going to talk about the veils this morning just because of time. But Hebrews 10 verse 20 says, By a new and living way, which He have consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say His flesh. We understand by the colors of the veil. We understand by God is the way, the truth, and the life that we discussed in the first series, uh, or in the first part of the series, that Jesus is our entrance. Um, we know that in the late latter temple, God, when Jesus was crucified, God came and He tore the veil from top to bottom, opening up access for us to get into the presence of Jesus. Amen. And we're going to start off with the table of showbread this morning. It's also called showbread, uh, which means the bread of the presence. Now, there's a, uh, when you do a lot of Bible study, you, you learn that there's something called the law of first mention. And this was the first time that the word table was mentioned in the Bible, was with the table of showbread. And it had special meaning. It meant that it's God's care and generosity. It means that it's God's provision. Usually on the table we have bread or we have food or um, we have cake, which we don't have today for some reason. <laughs> God's communion is on the table. So, so the fact that there's a, the first time it's mentioned means that we have to look at what it is, and, and that's what it is. It's God saying, I want you to commune with me. I want you to sit around the table with me, and I want us to talk, and I want us to share, and I want us to have communion. I want you to see when we talk about the table that it's about the generosity and the goodness of God. Amen. John 6, 5, 1 says, I am the living bread. Which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. What's interesting about the show bread, it was, there were 12 of them. And the 12 breads spoke about the 12 tribes of Israel that camped about the tabernacle. And when I was doing research, I found something, and this is maybe a bit of just me looking deeper than I should, getting more excited than I should. But every Sabbath, the bread was split between the high priest and the Levites, the people that, that did work in the, in the tabernacle. And the split was interesting for me. The high priest got five loaves. Can you remember that the number five talks about grace? Jesus Christ is our grace. You know, the Bible says that the law was given to Moses, but grace came through Christ. When I give you something, I give you a gift, and I send it via someone, it's nice, it's a gift, you have it. But if I make effort, and I bring it to you, and I come with the gift, it's more special. So law was given. And this talks to me about high priests being, five loaves being grace came. Seven is the number of perfection. We have perfect standing before God. And we're going to see it in a number of places this morning. Perfect standing before God because of the grace that was given to us. Amen. So we have this bread of life 
that we don't have to do every week and bake fresh and make sure it's warm like they had to. We have Jesus Christ, that's our bread, that fills us, that replenishes us, that refreshes us. It's critical. And it's your responsibility to make sure that you have daily bread. Amen. It's our privilege to have daily bread. You know, I was thinking while I was sitting there and the people were singing, what a privilege they have to be singing in front. What a responsibility. They don't just come up here and sing. They come up here to take us into the presence of God. Amen. And you, if you down there, I don't know, I'm not standing up here when they're singing, but my prayer and my ask to you is sing with everything within you. Get into the presence of God. Get into us breaking bread together in the presence of God. Amen. It's for you. It's God has done, everything is done for you. Amen. The next thing they looked at is the golden lampstand or the menorah. The Jewish um, uh, community still use the menorah on, on Hanukkah and things like that. So the golden lampstand, I want to read this, the Exodus where God spoke to, to Moses and explaining to him how you will do this. And I'm very excited about this one. I'm actually excited about all of it, but very excited about this. Exodus 25, 31 and 34. And thou shalt make a candlestick, which is actually wrong because candles haven't been invited. So it's a lamp stand. It uses oil. And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. Of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knobs and his flowers shall be of the same. And six branches shall come out of the side of it. Three branches of the candlestick out of the one side and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. Three bowls made like unto almonds with a knob and a flower and in one branch. And three bowls made like almonds in the other branch with a knob and then a flower. So in the six branches that come out of the candlestick. So what he's saying before I read verse 4, there's a candlestick. And there's branches coming out. So there's one candlestick, but six branches coming out. And in the candlestick shall be four bowls made unto almonds with their knobs and their flowers. So the six candlesticks talks about humanity. The number six in the Bible, whenever you see that, it talks about humanity. It talks about man. It talks about mankind or humanity. It sometimes talks about Jesus coming in the form of a servant as a man. Uh, when, you, when you look at the number seven again, it's perfection. So in the six candlesticks, before we even get to the almonds, we see that it forms part of the church. But what's interesting, and you can't, I don't know if you can see it on the photo, but when the cups were made for the lampstand, they were made to face a certain way. So they faced... If, if, the, if the candlestick was here, the cups would have faced in front towards the showbread. So they would have been skewed like that. Because they had to bring light. I'm too excited. They had to bring light to the front, to the showbread. Amen. We do this in remembrance of Him. What's very interesting is that the candlestick was lit and the fire was taken from the altar of sacrifice. The Bible teaches us that the altar of sacrifice was lit by God. Nobody came to the bronze altar and made a fire. God said, this is how I want you to build it, and I will come and light it. And light came from heaven, fire came from heaven, and lit the altar. And that altar was always supposed to be burning. So was the menorah. So was the altar of incense. Because there's always, the work of God is always complete in our lives. Amen. Only one that was lit was the candlestick in the middle. And from the middle fire, from the middle little flame, they would take that flame and then write a light from right to left, the rest. The sacrifice of Jesus is enough to light the middle stick, which also represents Jesus. Our light and our fire is not because of our sacrifice. It's because of His sacrifice. The, the reason the lamps are showing to the middle lamp is because we always look to Jesus. 
for our righteousness. We always look to Jesus uh, for, for whatever we do. Our presence, that's why he started with the ark. The presence of God is always the place we start our lives, our plans, our marriages, our work. Jesus should be the center point of everything you do. If you sit here this morning, and I doubt you do, but if there's anyone that sits here this morning and thinks I'm a self-made man, and it's all about me, and I'm the guy that did it, or I'm the girl that did it, I have bad news for you. It's all about Jesus. You were created to bring honor to Him. The lampstands were pointing to Him to bring honor to Him. Amen. Are you with me? Am I too loud this morning? It represented a golden almond tree. An almond tree is very interesting because an almond tree is the first tree that blooms in, in, in J Jerusalem or in Israel after the winter. And it talks about new life. It talks about life from winter. It talks about life from death. It screams of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is our proof that the salvation is complete. Not only did he die, but he was raised on the third day. Therefore, I have boldness and confidence, and I'm not ashamed of this gospel of Jesus Christ, because I know he didn't only die, but he was brought up. Amen. Remember last week I said it's a receipt for me to say that my penalty has been paid. Amen. Amen. You're still with me? Are you awake? Yes. Say to the guy next to you, hold on, we're going. <laughs> what was fantastic about the menorah, it was made out of one block of gold. It was beaten work. Even today, scholars don't know how it, how it was done. It was literally one big block of gold. God said to them, I don't want you to take this piece and that piece and put it together and melt it together. There's one, but, and I want a guy that I will put my spirit on, and he will beat that with a little hammer and chisel and build this menorah out of the one block. Isaiah 53 said, but he was wounded. For our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes, we are healed. 2 Peter 2.24 says, He with his own self bear our sins in his body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you are healed. Luke 22, 63 and 64, And the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. Your New King James Bible or your NIV will say they beat him. And when they had blindfolded him, they beat him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophecy, prophesy, who is that, uh, who, who that smote thee or beat thee? Jesus Christ is the candlestick. Jesus Christ was beaten, broken for your salvation. Jesus Christ was beaten, broken, stripes on his back for your healing. Amen. Can you see how this all points to Jesus Christ? Not just the shaft, not just the almonds, being the firstborn among many. He was the firstborn among his brethren as he was raised from the dead. Amen. Also, what the candlestick had to do was bring light. We know from John 8, 12 that then, Jesus, then spake Jesus again to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follow, followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Jesus is our light. Jesus shows us the path. Jesus leads us where we need to go. We have to be absolutely dependent on Him. I've explained the first light. Not only is Jesus our light, but as a church, we are the light of the world. You know, in Revelation, God comes and He speaks to the seven churches. And five of the seven churches, and you, I, I didn't put it down here because I don't want to go off on, a, on some rabbit trail but this morning. But five of the seven churches, He rebukes. And the thing He rebukes them about is things like, you left your first love. Jesus wasn't center in those churches anymore. The Bible says in, John, uh, uh, in Luke 8.16, No man, when he hath lighted a candle, cover it with a vessel, or put it under a bed, but set it on a candlestick, that they which enter may see the light. You are the light of the world. 
As a church, we have to shine. We, you should never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's, it's the light that the world needs. Amen. So not only is He our light, but we are lit from Him so that we can also shine. We are also the light of the world. Amen. Now I want to show you something which I've, for years I was taught wrong on this. And I really hope this is a revelation for you this morning. John 15 verse 1 to 15. I'm not going to read everything. I'm going to read the first verse to you. I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman, the winemaker. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now I was taught that if you don't perform as a Christian, you're going to get snipped. God's going to take you away. Because that's what the Bible says here. He takes you away. And I was always thinking, but how does that work now? Because Jesus paid for everything, but yet I have to deserve this. And if I don't deserve this, how does He take me? Does He give me sickness? Is He actually going to take me out? How does that take of away work? And I could never figure it out, but I was always making sure that I better not be taken out. And then I grew up with people that um, I remember once one of our, our, our um, young people in church was in an accident. And we drove with the youth leader. And as we drove with the youth leader to the hospital, I remember this guy praying, Lord, just forgive him for whatever he's done. And I'm thinking, whoa, did God cause the accident? Because now I'm also a youngster. And I'm thinking, but did God cause the accident? What did this guy do? Like, and all I'm praying is, Lord, it's my first car. If, <laughs> like, if there's anything I did, please forgive me. Just don't, I don't want this car to be in an accident or anything like that. But that's how we taught. And that's how we grow up. Do you know that the word take of away, if you go to the original text, it actually means to lift up. When a winemaker plants the, vi the vineyard and he plants the vines, he has something he calls a wine trellis, which literally looks like a cross. So they put these things down and then the, the, the vine gets planted next to the trellis and they have wires that run across and as the, 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 the branches start falling onto the ground, they pick it up and they put it on the wires. Because if you're in the ground, you die. You, you literally become, the, the branches that lay on the ground become like the ground. They become dirt. So these guys don't come and cut it off. They come and lift it up. You know, David says in Psalm 3 verse 3 that you are the shield that surrounds me. You are the lifter of my head. You know what that is? In biblical times, when poor people sat on the streets and something, and a rich man came past, and he saw somebody that he wanted to help, he would go to him, and he would lift his head. And he would literally be saying to him, from now on, I will look after you. You can come and I will make sure you have food and whatever you... Jesus Christ comes to us and He says, I am the lifter of your head. I've got you. I will look after you. I will make sure you have everything you need. Amen. Isn't that an awesome picture of Jesus Christ? Amen. I showed you the video this morning and it wasn't the fly over from the, from the old uh, tabernacle. I thought I showed you that enough. But... What they used within the lampstand was pure olive oil. Leviticus 24, verse 2. Leviticus in the Old Testament, by the way. I know people don't read it a lot. <laughs> Command the children of Israel, and they bring unto you, unto the pure oil, olive beaten for the light, to cause the lamps to burn continually. You saw it on the video this morning. The Garden of Gethsemane literally means get a place of pressing, shemanim wells. Gethsemane means the place of pressing olives. Do you know that Jesus Christ was pressed? His tears, he was sweating tears, uh, 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 blood. His 
body was pierced. His body was broken. It was crushed so that we can have the victory. So that we can have His light, His Spirit dwelling in us, shining in us all the time. Luke 22, 44 says, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, that his sweat, uh, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. He is our Gethsemane. That's why he prayed in Gethsemane. He is our olive. He is our crushing. He is our, uh, our everything. Amen. I pray that this creates a desire in your heart to just get to know Him more and more and more. Amen. Then we're going to move to the golden altar, the altar of incense. This was the last um, furniture piece actually to be, to be done. And fire was to be taken from the brazen altar again. So they took coals and they brought it into this altar let me read it to you. Leviticus 16.12 And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord. And his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil. Jesus Christ, we learned last week, is the brazen altar. He is our sacrifice. He is our offering. Not only the altar, but everything that gets placed on the offer speaks of Jesus and what he's done for us. From that sacrifice... We can go today to Jesus, uh, to the Father, in the name of Jesus. Do you know that the name of Jesus is above every other name? I don't know your circumstances. I don't know your sicknesses. I don't know your, uh, your problems. I know it's got a name. And I know my Jesus. And I know my, the name of my Jesus is above the name of your circumstances. This altar speaks of the fact that I can go to Him in that name. It gives me authority. It gives me a standing to say, Lord, as I come to you today in the name of Jesus, and if I speak that name, I know there's power, there's life, and I know it's going to be answered. <coughs> Amen. Let me just take a... If I shout, I get thirsty. That's crazy. John 14, 13 and 14. And, what, and whosoever, or whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Psalm 141 verse 2. Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Revelations 5 verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are prayers of saints. Some of your Bible says full of incense. The incense is our prayers continually burning before God. Your prayers, you might say to me this morning, Rian, I've been praying and praying and praying and nothing's changed. I want to tell you this morning, it's still burning before God. Your answer is on the way. Amen. You might not have it now, but it's on the way. This Bible teaches me that if I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the name above every name, the name that every knee will bow and confess that He's Lord and, and Savior, my prayers will be answered. Amen. You know, in the, in the home group on Wednesday, one of the gents, Akesh, uh, I don't know what we spoke about, but he said, what's very important is how we see Jesus. And I've mentioned it from up here before, and I want to just mention it again this morning. Your opinion of Jesus and what He's done for you and how good He is for you is critical. If you have an opinion that God doesn't want to bless you, that is out to get you, you can never go with confidence to ask. I want to assure you this morning that God is for you. Jesus Christ died for you. Romans says that if He gave His Son, why will He hold anything back? He won't hold anything back. We can ask according to His will. You can ask anything. Amen. According to His will. I was driving into the place that we're staying in the garage, just before our garage, there was a McLaren. And I was thinking, mm, 
I said, somewhere in the Bible, because I could really like use this car. <laughs> so we pray His will. Amen. The golden altar was also made from acacia wood. It was overlaid with gold. I want to read you two verses out of Hebrews 8. I'm not going to read the whole Hebrews 8. But I just want to read you two verses. Verse 6. But as it now is He, Christ, has acquired a priestly ministry which is as much superior and more excellent than the old, as the covenant agreement, of which He has been the mediator or the agent, is superior and more excellent because it is enacted and rests upon more important promises. What they had here, the incense they broke, the high priest that, or the priest that had to put the incense, and it was a special incense. The, the, the rest of the community was not allowed to use the spices and things they used here. Uh, that was a type. Today, we have... Listen to this. Let me read one more out of eight before I jump the gun. Verse 12. For I will be merciful and gracious towards this, and I will remember their deeds and their unrighteousness no more. Romans 8.34 Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Not only have we been given access to pray, to approach God's throne with boldness, to approach His throne with grace, with confidence. But this word teaches me that Jesus is praying for me. He's praying for you. Do you know what Jesus is doing right now? He's praying for you. I thought that would get one amen. <laughs> Literally, Jesus is standing in front of His Father right now, saying, I want you to bless Him. I thank you that I've paid the price, Father. Please bless them. That's the Jesus we serve. He's a good God. He's a good Father. He's standing in for you. Amen. Last few. Are you ready? The ark. The ark was, is in two parts. And I'm going to move to this side if it's okay. So the bottom box of the ark was made from acacia wood. And it was overlaid with gold. The top part or the lid was pure gold. Pure gold. When the Bible talks about gold being overlaid over wood, it talks about div divine righteousness. It's not our own righteousness. The wood is our humanity. The, 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 the golden overlay is the, the divinity. It's God, it's Jesus Christ becoming our righteousness because we couldn't do it ourselves. The top the lid with the two cherubim was actually pure gold. When it talks about pure gold, it talks about there's no humanity here. It's all holiness. It's all God. It's all divinity. Amen. What was inside the ark? It was actually something inside the ark. So the first three things. The first thing was the manna. And the manna speaks of the rejection of God's people for His provision. Remember when they were in the, in the desert, they started complaining that they're tired of the manna now. Can only have so much of this bread. It's like it's now enough. So God told Moses, take that and keep it in the ark. Take some of it. And that never got rotten. The manna in the desert only lasted one day. This was, it was always fresh. The other thing that was in the, in the ark was the Ten Commandments, the second set. Who was the first guy that broke the Ten Commandments? Moses. Remember, he dropped it, so he broke it. <laughs> that was a rejection of God's standards, God's requirements. I said to you last week, the law wasn't wrong. The law pointed us towards Christ. The law pointed the Israelites to say, you need a Savior more than you know. The law was holy. So God said, I want you to put the law in the ark as well, the Ten Commandments. And then Aaron's staff. I don't know if you remember, but 
the Israelites came to Moses and they said, we don't want Aaron to be the high priest. We're not interested in his leadership. So Moses says, okay, this is what we'll do. Every one of the leaders, bring your staffs, your rods to me. We're going to leave them overnight in the holy place. And we'll see, God will select, we'll see who God selects in the morning. And the next morning, when they came in, Aaron's rod, remember these are dead sticks lying on the ground, had almonds, flowers, remember where we saw that? Renewal. New life. My choice. God being raised on the third day, it just, everything speaks about Him. Amen. And then what God did is He says, I want you to take this pure gold lid and close the ark. These cherubim, when they look, they look towards this piece in the middle. This little piece over here is what you call the mercy seat. So the cherubim looked at the mercy seat. Remember my example, if this is me, and this is Jesus Christ, and I'm in Jesus you don't see me, you see Jesus. When, they, when the cherubim, which is an example of God, looks down at us, he doesn't see our rejection of God's goodness, of God's provision, of God's standard. He only sees the mercy seat. He only sees Jesus. Jesus is the mercy seat. I'm going to show you something very cool a bit later. Jesus is our mercy seat. He only sees the blood of the sacrifice. Amen. So what's interesting about this whole thing is, that, and, and what we should be so thankful about is, once a year on Yom Kippur, the, the high priest could go in. He could go into the Holy of Holies. So they took a bullock. They had to take a bullock. Um, and he was, was then to, to go in and, and make a sacrifice for him and for the people. Amen. So I jumped the gun. Let me go back. Sorry. Give me one second to, to just talk to you about this. When Moses did all of this, God said to him, um, And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee, and I will come with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim. When God talks to us today, it's out of grace. If you hear this morning... And you're sitting and you're telling me God is talking to me and He's telling me that I'm not good enough or I'm not making the grade or this is happening or that's happening. God talks from a place of grace. God will never come with condemnation. He will never come with you not good enough. He will never come with you that you didn't make the grade, that you're not the standard that He wants. Romans 3.25 says, Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that, has, that are passed through the forbearance of God. That word propitiation is payment. That word in the Greek is Hilasterion, which literally means mercy seat. This verse should read this way. Whom God has set forth to be a mercy seat through faith. He talks to us through His Son. The Word became flesh. He talks to us through His Word. And it's good. And it's blessing. And it's grace. And it's favor. It's never condemnation. Amen. Please be free this morning. If you're hearing voices of condemnation, it's not the Lord. Amen. Psalm 91 verse 1. 911. Call the police. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Look at this. This was where God resided, by the way. This was God's seat in the tabernacle. Shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. We have the shadow of the Almighty. We're abiding in Christ. The Bible teaches in Him we live and move and have our being. We're abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. Now I can go to the priest. So once a year, this priest goes and he says, I must make sacrifice. And we're nearly finished. 
I must make sacrifice. So they slaughter a bullock. So I didn't go into the priestly way, but they had little bells on the, on the bottom of, of, the, of their cloaks or robes. Because when they went into the Holy of Holies, if they weren't accepted, they fell. They literally died. So they had a rope around them. And then they walked in. And the other priest was standing at the outside thinking, I wonder if the boy's going to make it. So he's walking in and they're hearing bells. They say, he's still all right. If the bells stop, pull him out. So they're listening to the bells. And this guy, the high priest, is so scared. He's got some incense that smokes a lot. And he's smoking out the whole place. Because there were three lights. I, I, I didn't mention it to you. But there are three lights that around the tabernacle. Outside was the sun. It was natural light. Inside the holy place was the lampstand that gave light. In the Holy of Holies, the veil was so thick, there was no light in there. The Shekinah of glory of God filled that place. That's where God lived. That's where He he was the light in that place. So they believed that if they saw God, they would fall, fall dead. So He would go in and He would smoke up the place, literally, just in fear that He might see God. Then what He would do, Leviticus 16, 14... This is more Leviticus than some of you have ever read, eh? I'm joking. And he shall take off the blood of the bullock and sprinkle with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall be sprinkled of the blood with his finger seven times. So this is what happened. He walks in. He does his incense. He takes the blood. He sprinkles it on the mercy seat once. Then he takes the blood and he sprinkles it in front on the ground seven times. Look at this. I'm excited. Jesus paid for our sins once and for all. Hebrews 10.10 10 says, by, the, by, which we will, uh, we, uh, by which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. One sprinkling on the seed, once for all. Our Jesus paid once for all. This guy had to do it once a year. Seven times on the ground. Seven again is the number of perfection. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no uh, sin, that we might be the righteousness of God in him. Righteousness means right standing. The priest had to spray, uh, uh, had to flick seven times because that's where he needed to stand. He had to make sure that his standing before God was right. So the sacrifice had to be made for his stand. Me and you today have a right standing. We can go into the throne of grace boldly at any time because our standing has been paid for. We have right standing before God all the time. Now this mercy seat, and this is my last slide before we get into the communion. Look at this scripture. But Mary stood without the tomb uh, uh, weeping. And she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And see of two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had laid. Are you seeing it? One at the head, and the other at the feet. Jesus, I wonder if Mary knew she's looking at the real mercy seat. Not the ark, not the sample, not an example, not a shower, a shadow. This, this is an actual picture of where they believe Jesus was buried this is the actual picture of the tomb and i actually believe this could be the tomb because look at this side here is flat and that side is flat it's not something you always find in the tombs of those days and this scripture says someone's sitting at the feet someone's sitting at the head mary was literally looking at the mercy seat amen can we give out the elements please Amen. I hope this blessed you this morning. And I hope this morning that you can see that everything points to Him. And that He's done everything on your behalf. Amen. We honor you, Father.
hundred. Stand with me. Amen. Father, you're an awesome, awesome God. You're an awesome, awesome Father. Lord, as we partake of your body, we do it in remembrance for what you've done for us. That you were pressed, you were crushed. By your stripes you brought healing to us. By the brokenness of your body you brought salvation. As we break bread this morning with you, Father, we thank you that we see you serving us, your body. That you are the bread of life. And as we partake this morning, it will bring life into your body. We honor you, Father. We thank you this morning for your body. We thank you for the price you have paid. Thank you that you died in our stead, Lord. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, please partake. Thank you for your blood that covers our sins. We thank you for your blood that brings forgiveness. We thank you that the precious blood has paid a price that we could never pay. And we do this in remembrance of you. We love you, Lord. Please partake. Amen. Father, we thank you that we had the honor the privilege to spend time with you in your word this morning. I pray, Lord, that this week that you would show yourself strong to your people, that you would bless them. You're a good God, Lord. You're a good, good God, Lord. We give you all the honor. We give you all the honor. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all in this week. Father, I pray your richest blessing. I pray for wisdom. I pray for understanding. I pray for your grace to become a revelation in the lives and the hearts of your people. I pray for each person here and each person online that they would understand your goodness, your love for them, Father. You're such an awesome Father, Lord. We love you. We appreciate you. We bless you. You are, you are our everything. You are our all in all. Thank you, Lord. Bless your church. Bless your body. Thank you that you open the right doors. Thank you that you surround us with your favor. Thank you that you are the lifter of our heads. That you strengthen us. We honor you, Lord. I pray in this week that you will absolutely just go before your people. Make the way straight. Thank you for that, Lord. Amen. Have a blessed week. Amen. Amen.